Welcome back to Future Fast, and uh, once again we have Dr. Jane with us. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the name Dr. Jane, I would really urge you to look up the first part of the podcast that we have, wherein she shares a journey. And uh, for the rest of you, I'm sure you're waiting to hear what is it that she's currently busy with, and also she already mentioned uh, World Metaverse Council. So uh, let's let's dive into the conversation. And uh, Dr. Jane, thank you so much for uh, staying on to be part of this effort that we are trying to do in the future fast. So uh, what can you please uh, uh, talk about uh, the World Metaverse Council, right, uh, in terms of, uh, you did mention it uh, very briefly that you're bringing in, so you gave a, 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 a 60,000 view, if I can say that way, that the areas that, so what is it that you are driving? I know you are the chairperson for it, uh, so, what is your focus area on uh, World Metaverse Council in the near term? Okay, so so I think there's two pieces here. One is there's this amazing new technology that's growing very fast. There's hundreds of companies that are building various metaverse applications. Um, and the, so the technology is moving fast, but there's also risks that ne we need to be made aware of. There's no standards, there's no regulation. So it's a pretty wild west open space. So that's one piece. The second piece is the knowledge about the technologies that make up the metaverse doesn't reside in one place. And this is an issue for all technology. So there are people all around the world Many of them are not in traditional institutions who are building and creating and imagining these new futures. So the only way in my mind to be able to really understand what are the developments, how fast they're moving, how they're working, is to somehow crowdsource the intellect of all of these people around the world who are all building, doing, creating in different ways. So, so my idea was to do one thing, was crowdsource that knowledge creating this distributed think tank. And the second one was to start to harness it so that we could give information to governments and regulators and organizations and say, look, here's some of the risks that are coming up that you might have to consider in regulation. Here are some of the basic requirements that will need to be sorted out for standards and terminology. And here's education where there's amazing things going on that can transform the way that we educate kids. And here's all the examples. So learn from the people who are already doing it. And this is what's happening in healthcare. So it's really creating a repository of knowledge and learning that can help people start thinking about, well, if I need a metaverse strategy for my school, university, institution, country, hospital, where can I go and learn about what people are doing? So we want to become that go-to place for anyone who wants to come and find out things, you know, about the metaverse, the technologies, open metaverse, Web3, all of those things. So, you know, it's a new organisation and we obviously started with um, optimism and ambition and we'll see how it goes. But as I said on the other podcasts, we're a 1,000 people, 100 countries and growing. So... I think there's a need for it. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, Metaverse currently is dominated by game development, which is natural, right? Uh, right now, all the Metaverse is primarily built on top of the gaming platform. So how do you see the adoption by uh, serious business, serious businesses uh, from even healthcare that you mentioned? Right now, whatever the attempt, it's coming from a tech community. But the real adoption is when the all the other businesses come into it. So I assume that is the role Meta World Metaverse Council is trying to play in terms of bringing it. But how how do you see this evolving? Okay, so so let me let me kind of say the way that I my typology of metaverse works. So one, you've got all of the big techs, Facebook, Meta, Apple, Google, they're building immersive experiences that that are metaverses. 
but they're not open, they're not decentralized, they're not Web3. They'll use similar models to that that they use now, and they'll offer immersive experiences to their customers. Second, as you rightly point out, are the gamers. And, you know, there's 3 billion gamers. They've got lots of um, wonderful technologies and immersive opportunities. And so they're really way ahead of the game. But they're not all Web3 either. Then you've got the Web3 metaverses like Sandbox and Decentraland and Alluvium. And they're deliberately trying to build these Web3 metaverses. And then I only put in the fourth country because I think it's a, a fourth um, element is governments, because what we're seeing now is a number of governments embracing the metaverse and saying we can provide services in a metaverse environment. So I include Dubai, Saudi Arabia, the city of Seoul in South Korea, and others are coming on board. So in answer to your question, no one is going to enter any metaverse unless they think it's going to do something that, that's good for them or solve a problem that they've got. So Good. I don't think anyone's going to just be randomly thinking, I'll go and have a metaverse experience today. But if they well, go, uh, well, I can do metaverse and I can go do my shopping and I don't have to leave home, they might do that. Or if the healthcare starts being offered to you um, and you don't have to drive down to see the doctor and wait in the waiting room and there's services that you want. And mental health is a very good example of that then you're quite likely to take that up. And similarly with education. So I think the answer to metaverse adoption is social utility. Simple as that. Well, uh, we do have some banks in India working on metaverse because they, are, they just want to be the first bank to be on metaverse. But uh, uh, despite all this, see, there is some amount of hype drives a lot of companies or businesses to be there to say they were the first to be there. and uh, should it uh, or will it end up becoming, you know, I've already spent a million, so let me spend three million to sustain it, right? And if it happens so, so look, then I mean, people will yeah. lose interest in metaverse. Well, I mean, yes, it's, it's the early days of the internet. But in India, Apollo Hospitals has partnered with uh, a gaming company to create gamified experiences for um, mental health, post-traumatic stress disorder and so forth. And actually, I've seen at least half a dozen mental health applications. It's still in the experimental stage, but what we're seeing in a number of areas of healthcare, mental health, digital twins, both for construction of facilities and for complex operations in education, these are in use. They're not fully at scale metaverses or any other such thing, but what we're seeing is use cases being proven in a number of different sectors that will be able to be built on. But as I said, we're in the early days of the internet. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies building metaverses. Many of them won't last. And we've yet to see which are the ones that are actually going to connect with users, build those communities, provide the utility people want, and will be the ones that we see for the next 10 or 20 years? We don't know the answer to that yet. See, uh, uh, I think device dependency is one of the biggest limitations of the metaverse adoption, right? Uh, so how do you see this playing out? What did you As say was the, the VR... limitation? I Devices, we, we, I are, think, we are, I don't yes. think, yeah. I don't think the future of metaverse will be those devices, absolutely not. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because it makes it unaffordable and unattainable for the majority of the population. And the second is because it's uncomfortable and it's, you know, there's nothing good about it except that you can experience a metaverse. So people will, in, will continuously innovate and are to create much simpler ways of us having an immersive experience. And I use the term immersive experience because... I don't think metaverse is necessarily fully immersive. It can be augmented reality, um, which is provided. And, and I would be saying in India, most people will be uh, entering the metaverse through either laptops, tablets, or mobiles. And it'll be a mobile-enabled metaverse in India for the majority well, of people uh... because um, they have mobiles, they have access. And if you build for mobile, people will be able to use it. 
Well, uh, Reliance, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Reliance. In fact, uh, Meta, the Facebook company, they acquired 10% in Reliance Geo, their digital arm of uh, Reliance. So uh, they are uh, promoting uh, uh, 2,500 rupees, which is like uh, uh, about $40, $40, around $40, uh, $40, $45 uh, VR gear. So, uh, uh, so uh, I don't think it's the same Oculus Meta that uh, Meta sells, which is like really expensive. But uh, uh, Reliance is selling. I've not tried it yet. I should look it up. Uh, but uh, uh, people are saying that okay, that's a game changer because imagine having forty dollars. Uh, if I can have a, a, a gear, and there are a lot of people are going to be uh, getting onto Metaverse. So, uh, but well, we, we still that, have to that see that That'll be part. the game changers. Um, yeah, I, I suspect it for may the be on audience. a subscription model. What it is, whether it'll be that or something else, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but uh, I, I do believe I, I share the Yeah, same, well, we'll uh, see. We don't yeah. know the answer yet. But... Right. Right. And uh, uh, how do you... Uh, uh, foresee the future, particularly in the sustainability space, you mentioned that. How do you see adoption of metaverse or the impact of metaverse in the sustainability space and uh, social impact space? That's okay. what your yeah. many years of your life was spent in that. Well, I think we've got to kind of separate that into two pieces. The one that we have to accept and acknowledge and think about is that anything digital, anything IT, anything computers, is creating waste, digital waste, e-waste um, that's hard to deal with and it's creating a carbon footprint that's hard to deal with. So that's the first thing to say is that everything, whether it's metaverse or whether it's any other kind of technology, creates a digital footprint that governments and the world need to deal with in, in terms of sustainability and the circular economy. We don't dispose of this waste very well. We do have blockchains, for example, that are very energy intensive. That all needs to be dealt with. But the second piece, um, which is around metaverse and sustainability, and I, I think that the real potentials are the immersive experiences that you can create that help people understand what really are the problems of impacted community, what really is the impact of climate change on ice flows, for example, or, you know, what's happened to communities who have increasing natural disasters caused by, you know, climate change and so forth. So I think I think what it can do, and we have a, we're working on something at the World Metaverse Council for COP, for the climate conference, which is like an immersive metaverse with connected worlds that people can go into and they can travel from one city in the world to another to see all the different things that they're doing for sustainability. So I think what it can do is bring the education and understanding closer to people, help them really see and understand what the impact is, and then help them see and learn what they can do about it. So I think that'll be the benefit. Well, uh, uh, what are your uh, rituals or daily uh, practice that you do to keep yourself uh, relevant, you know, updated and uh, stay relevant because there's so many things happening in the technology space across the world and uh, and also uh, your interests are obviously very varied right i mean you have uh, interest in the healthcare space in the sustainability space and uh, uh, technology uh, uh, digital uh, transformation so how do you keep yourself uh, 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 you know is there a routine for yourself uh, your yeah, daily routine so... or something yeah, every morning. So I'm in a lot of WhatsApp groups. I'm in a lot of Telegram groups. I get a lot of information from LinkedIn and Twitter. So every morning when I wake up, I go through all my WhatsApp, Telegram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and I get all the news feeds and I, you know, find out as much new things as I can. Uh, some of them require me to read it. Then I, you know, send it somewhere else to a file for future reading. And then I go for a, a walk every morning. I go for an hour's walk because that's how I kind of clear my head and prepare for the day. And, and I go to a lot of conferences and I talk to a lot of people. 
especially, you know, companies often approach me and say they want to show me what they're doing. And when I can, I always have a look because they might be doing something really cool I'd never heard of before. So every day, everywhere I look, I'm trying to learn. And there's so many places you can learn from. Well, uh, uh, who, according to you, are doing something really significant in blockchain and meta space, which is obviously going to impact in future? Look, I don't want to call out individual companies, although I could, because then you miss out other companies that are also really good. But where I think, I personally think the whole play to earn gaming and the creation of new economies in metaverse and blockchain is really important because even though it it wasn't a successful experiment, Axie Infinity, we learned that it was possible to be able to reward people for participating um, in these economies. I, I think that the work in creating these kind of community-driven and owned economies and figuring out how to uh, reward content creators and other creators for their work are very promising. But I also think work that's been ongoing in blockchain in relation to financial inclusion and, you know, poor farmers supply chains and all of those things is really important and is growing in kind of credibility and value. And I, while I'm very interested in healthcare and I think there's a lot there, I think the one that can really be a game changer is metaverse education. And so I'm really doubling down on trying to see all the different things people are doing for metaverse education and think about, because the thing that bothers me at the moment and it must bother many people of generative AI and the change in the market that is going to um, happen very quickly. How do you skill those? So if you're a, and coding's not a job anymore, then how do you quickly can use metaverse and really highly, highly sort of digitized, datafied skills based to get people in to teach them the skills that they can use to go from being a coder maybe to being a metaverse developer or whatever we think the new jobs are going to be, to be a technician that fixes solar panels or, you know, so we need to think of what the new jobs are and think about how quickly to train people because it won't be through universities. And in fact, I saw something in with the American Bureau of Statistics saying 60% of the jobs of the future don't need a university degree. So this kind of skills-based digital training is going to be the key. And I think metaverse education will be transformational. Uh, do you want to talk about World Metaverse Council as what is it and what is the purpose of World Metaverse Council and how it's going to impact uh, everything metaverse yes. in the world? Yes, everything metaverse. I would love to talk about that. It's such an interesting time. So um, the World Metaverse Council was really formed late last year by a group of us working on Web3 and metaverse. And we realized that because the technology is moving so fast, there's no real central point where people can go and get information, whether it's on standards, regulation, ethics, what's going on in different sectors, open metaverse. And we thought it would be really great to just build a network of people who are interested in and working on the metaverse. So we, we started that and we now have uh, well over a thousand members in a hundred countries. And we have working groups working on standards, regulation, open metaverse, sustainability, education, and culture. And uh, we've also got an accreditation working group. So we've got a very, very active group of people from all around the world um, who are working on Metaverse. And it's a fantastic source of both inspiration and knowledge. Well, uh, uh, I know recently Meta announced uh, uh, a low cost uh, device, right? A VR glasses, while the Apple devices come up. And uh, uh, obviously this is, uh, there's a few generations of gap between what the Meta has and what Apple has. And uh, uh, it looks like world needs something what Apple has, but it's at a prohibitively expensive price of $3,000. And uh, 
So given this, how do you see the evolution of metaverse considering that amount of device dependency that it has currently and also the cost associated with that as of now? Yeah, look, Ma, I've always said that the the person who really wins in widespread adoption of metaverse is going to develop some sort of mobile or tablet enabled immersive experience. Because if you think of countries like India, there's no way that any kind of majority of people are going to be able to afford a headset, even a simpler version. I know there's cheaper ones coming out now. So I believe there are innovators working around the world on how you can have some sort of smartphone enabled immersive experience that will be suitable for a much wider spread adoption. I mean, I think the headsets and other kinds of infrastructure will be there, but it will be for the privileged few, not for the many. Sorry, I've lost you. I've yeah, lost no, the... I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, ah. So uh, uh, now, uh, given this, and obviously the technology is developing, and even Apple says that it may be another two years or so before you know more developer community join in and build uh, technologies for it, even for their price to come down. So uh, uh, given that, uh, how do you see the governments are responding? Because I I do understand that you. Uh, you're working with governments and a lot of government agencies. So how do you see them adopting Metaverse? Well, I mean, obviously it's variable across the world, but there are some governments, and particularly here in the Middle East, who are very bullish about Metaverse. Um, and Saudi and Dubai and Qatar are all working very hard on this. Um, and, I mean, I wouldn't take my knowledge and information from what Apple and Meta are saying, because if you actually dig a little bit deeper and you look around at the entrepreneurs who are building metaverses, metaverse as a service, tools to help people use metaverse better, um, there's many of them, hundreds and hundreds of companies that are building things that are going to enable us to use metaverse. You want to make a digital twin? You can go to someone who's doing Metaverse as a service. They'll build your digital twin for you. So I think one of the challenges is um, there's not enough information on what's going on. And it's hard to, if you like, verify or do due diligence on everyone who says they've got a Metaverse as to what it is and whether they've got it and how it is. But what I do know is... Um, the areas where I think that we're going to see governments taking a big interest, and Korea is another country that's really advancing on this, is in things like health, education, and citizen services. So Korea, for example, has said that in Seoul, all the citizen services will be provided in the metaverse. So if you want um, a license, you want to pay your parking fine, you want to open a business registration, that's going to all be done in the metaverse. And I think particularly with the um, enablement of generative AI, things like chat GPT, that's going to make this very much more achievable. And I think we're just going to see the possibilities really increase. Right. Uh, I, I directly uh, see the use case in education, which is very obvious, uh, right? But uh, uh, most of these self-service, uh, in fact, there were some banks also talking about Metaverse uh, uh, for uh, engaging customers. But do you really think these use cases are as relevant? I, I, I for one, think that this can actually become uh, some sort of a... Uh, 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 you know, uh, this may lead to some people think that metaverse is not worthwhile because the use cases are not as strong as in the case of uh, education or somewhere where well, it can well, really they are. You just, amplify no, they, the value. They are. I have to uh, differ with you on that. You just don't know about them. So, I mean, in India, for example, so one of the really important use cases is mental health. And there's a lot of uh, metaverse projects being developed in a number of countries around the world uh, on mental health. And Apollo Hos Hospitals has actually entered into a partnership with a gaming com company to develop gamified services for 
um, post-traumatic stress disorders and other mental health disorders. So mental health is one, very clear use cases. So the second one is um, gamification for wellness and fitness. So in most countries, we have too many people who have lifestyle diseases, they're overweight, they eat the wrong things, they're not fit. And so there's a whole plethora of products being developed now that incentivize and reward people for taking exercise or changing their lifestyle. So that's the second one I think is going to be important. The third one um, is you've mentioned education. And so that applies in education of medical students and healthcare workers because they can learn in a much more immersive way um, the anatomy of the body, how to conduct surgeries and so forth. Um, the use of digital twins is already uh, well advanced in surgery because what's happening now is that doctors are able to have a digital twin created of a tumour and then they can do their surgical planning in a very, very precise way. And then similarly for planning of new health facilities, people can collaborate using digital twins from um, all around the world. And so scientific discovery in a collaborative way globally is going to be enabled through the metaverse. So these are just some of the examples. But the other one I want to mention, because I think in a country like India, this is super relevant. So this is bringing together, because uh, you can't talk about these technologies in isolation, the technologies will converge. So if you add uh, generative AI, with metaverse-like experiences, what's possible? And this has actually been um, proven in a randomized controlled trial in Bangladesh, is that there are now diagnostic tools using AI, and the one that I'm speaking of diagnoses retinopathy very accurately. And so in that trial, what they were able to show was by having the patients first be diagnosed basically by an AI, and then go and see the doctor, it freed the ophthalmologist's time up to see more patients and to treat them better. And so what you'll see um, in many countries, but particularly countries where there's shortages of healthcare workers, is that the AI and the, the augmented or virtual reality, the avatars, will extend the capability of the specialists to provide more treatment to more patients at lower agree. cost. Completely agree. In fact, uh... Uh, I had met a few startups working on those fields uh, quite early, in fact, much before the chat GPT uh, came into, and, and, and in fact, it became a, a lingo of everybody pretty much. Uh, so I, I do completely agree. In fact, all the use cases you mentioned are uh, uh, obviously uh, the perfect use case. I was more referring to the banking, uh, bank talking about using Meta was more from engaging the customers, which I thought is not very uh, relevant. Yeah. So obviously, whatever you mentioned are classic uh, use cases. And uh, uh, what kind of policy direction is it going? Uh, I mean, you know, since you also work with governments, how is the policy getting impacted on these sites? Well, look, I think that's a struggle because I think that people are only now starting to grapple with what it means. And to some extent, chat GPT has given more impetus because policymakers waking up. So they've struggled. I mean, I need to relate metaverse to digital assets because a Web3 metaverse has blockchain digital assets token economies built into them. And so regulators have been struggling for a number of years to figure out how to regulate di digital assets. So all of that will apply, but be um, have a lot more complexity in a metaverse. But the EU seems to be moving faster. Jane, uh, there seems to be some connection issue here. Can you hear me? Sorry, it was I you're can frozen. Hear you. for... can you hear... can... Yeah, oh. yeah, no, it was well, frozen for some is time that okay? after the. Yeah, no, it's okay. Question again. Uh, well, you had uh, started talking about uh, EU is moving faster, and after that, it was completely muted. Okay. 
So, so the EU um, is very proactive when it comes to both digital assets and the metaverse, and they particularly have been looking at issues like protection of children in the metaverse. Um, and recently, International Telecommunications Union has set up a process to develop technical standards uh, for metaverse. And then we have a number of um, citizen organisations like World Metaverse Council, there's the Metaverse Safety Initiative, the Metaverse Standards Organisations, and the Open Metaverse Foundation, who've all set up just because we see there's a need to be able to develop policy and thinking um, around what's happening with the metaverse. But I would say absolutely governments are lagging uh, and they are struggling to understand uh, what to do and how to do it. But one of the things I have noticed, and I think this, this will sort of lead the governments, is increasingly I'm asked to speak at legal conferences. So all of the legal tech people realise that there's money to be made and there's a minefield of legislation and regulations in the metaverse. So I think they're inventing it as well and I'm sure they'll share their views with government. So it's slow, um, really not fast enough and people really don't understand it well enough, but there is movement. And uh, how are the large enterprises, uh, do you see them also reaching out to you and the World Metaverse Council in terms of adoption of uh, uh, metaverse do you see that happening i mean apart from the obvious tech chains the other businesses well large large industries um, are starting to use it bmw for example put its entire production line um in, you know through metaverse using digital twins and tested everything on that i think we'll see in manufacturing and a whole lot of areas where they're producing things in smart cities um, we're already seeing people are starting to use it in that way. Um, they tend to have, you know, the resources and the clout to be able to build it themselves. Uh, so they're probably not going to be, although they might be friends of the World Metaverse Council, they're probably not going to be customers of the World Metaverse Council. But, you know, we just want to provide knowledge and information and education to everyone so that it's accessible and fair, you know, to all. You also mentioned there are a lot of small companies who are doing some amazing work. Is there any anything that comes to your mind that you can talk about? What kind of work is happening uh, apart from the obvious big names in the startups or other businesses who are Just working one on second. this? What, what do you need? Oh, okay. Yeah, fix it then. Just come in. Come in. I'm on a call. So please don't dis don't disturb me. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Just change no it. Um. Yes, well, there are, well, there are small companies who are building, who are building metaverses, who are building tools for metaverses, who are working with big companies. I met with a deep tech company yesterday, who were working with some of the big names with how to put their brands in the metaverse. So there's a real um, cottage industry, I would say, of small startups, some of whom are wanting to service the bigger brands and some of whom who are uh, building their own metaverse, whether it's for, uh, a lot of it's for entertainment and a lot of it's for real estate and for um, art and culture is very popular. So there's just many of them. I think the question will be, it's really at the early days of the internet. Um, we never hear of Netscape anymore. I think this is that period. And so everyone's going to try, but who gets traction and who keeps their community is another question. I actually saw uh, in uh, Austin, Texas at Consensus, I did a fireside chat with uh, an Indian company who've got a Web3 game called Rush Universe, and they've got more than 500 active monthly, 500,000 active monthly users. So They've got the users and they're developing this with the sort of community shaping the future. So there's uh, many, many, many different, very interesting companies working in many countries in the world, including in India. So the sure. question is just what comes out of this. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of busyness. Um, but who survives? We've yet to see. So what would be your advice to them to from a point of ensuring that they survive and also succeed in this? 
but you you no, you've been observing a lot. Is, it, yeah, I mean, look, if I think that if they're business to community, they have to have a community. You can't build a metaverse and think people are going to come. So they should be looking to partner with groups who already have a very big community. And often things like sporting federations have a big community. So, you know, that's a good place to go. Um, but I think without community, they're going to struggle if they're doing um, community-based metaverses. The uh, second is in terms of working with industry, the, the two things I think they need to do is really really write up their use cases in a very powerful way. And preferably if they can find a research organization like a university who can write up their use case, what they've built and make it available so that when someone comes and says, well, what have you built? What can you build? Then they've got something more than saying, well, we've got a really cool tech team and we can build anything you want. They need to start to have things to show for it. And then they need to either go to conferences, win awards, win pitch competitions, shine a light on them so that they're going to get the interest um, of the bigger companies. So I think they're the things that companies should be thinking about. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Jane, thank you so much for sharing, uh, uh, apart from about World Metaverse Council, your perspective on how this is shaping up as a industry and we'll uh, want to get you back to talk about your perspective on the future. So uh, uh, thank you again for making time, you know, after after uh, it's been busy and you've been traveling across to multiple countries. So I completely understand on that. And uh, so please uh, do uh, 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 come back for that. And for the visit, uh, audience and listeners, uh, if you have missed the introduction or her journey, uh, which is amazing, uh, which is almost uh, 35, 40 years across doing very different things, obviously coming from the healthcare space and digital transformation. So please do go up, listen or look up to it. And uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it as much as you did with this. And uh, do come back to hear her perspective on the future. Till we uh, get to the next one, enjoy the ride. Thank you once again. Thank you.